Hello. Do you live in Cleveland, Cincinnati, or Frederick, Maryland? I'll be coming there this weekend. Friday, I'll be at Hilarities in Cleveland. Saturday, I'll be at Bombs Away Comedy in Cincinnati. And then Sunday night, I'll be at the Cellar Door in Frederick, Maryland. You can go to microscenecomedy.com to get your tickets. Tell your friends. Tell everybody, anybody who might who might uh, live in the area that you get to see the voice of a generation. All right? Um and uh, any other plugs before we start off? I'm opening for Luis Gomez March 14th through the 16th nice. in at the Comedy Connection in Rhode Island. So nice, come out. All right. great. And once again, you know, uh, my special is dropping March 21st. That'll be on the Out for Smokes YouTube channel. I'm really excited uh, for you guys to see it. Okay, let's get into uh, let's get into the episode. We all watched uh, the Octopus Murders on Netflix. Yeah. And uh so I guess I guess up top. Well actually up top, do you have any do we have any Gaza? Any Israel updates? Still doing a genocide. Mhm. Starving people. Yeah. I don't know. I I I ran into one of my uh, midwit friends last night over at the stand and uh I just I guess all I want to say is the that you got to push back. You might not want to do it, but you got to push back on all this uh anti-semitism crap. Now what does that mean? It means that uh, don't let people derail the conversation by by crying about you know their own little personal feelings and this narrative that doesn't really exist that Net not Net, that Netanyahu himself used to say <laughs> anybody who criticizes Israel is uh, it, that's that's anti-Semitism. Um, I think you know. Listen, I never said I was an intelligent person, but uh, there's a lot of Jewish people at these demonstrations. I think they understand the the situation, the uh, the urgency of what's happening in Gaza, and I don't want it. Don't, so don't let anybody derail the conversation, and don't let them scare you when they accuse you of being anti-Semitic. Who started the conversation? Uh, dumb, dumb Dylan Paladino. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Mike I said just, something about. I Mike is like, you know, I was, I was minding my own business in the stand, reading Mein Kampf, <laughs> and this fucking guy comes up to me, dude. I had some guests to the show. It's a couple black Israelites. Well, not no, they they wouldn't be. Uh, they would be not on my side, probably. Mike's but like, anyway, yeah. Slowly, I began to hate them. Wow, yeah. this guy really knows what he's talking about, huh? Yeah, we'll get into more of this on the Patreon, patreon.com slash out for smokes. We'll do a little, uh, you know, we'll drop some more names, but uh, <laughs> but don't let people, don't happening? let people, don't let people, <laughs> <laughs> don't let people, you know, you know, uh, uh, derail the conversation. Don't be afraid of being accused of stuff because th- that's really the only, the only play they have in the playbook. It's not really, it's not really working anymore. <laughs> I guess that's all I want to say. You guys have anything to add? No, no. I you don't? Listening. I stopped listening. So no, I'm the is, only one who's... this. Yeah, no, this feels very you walking into places, having issues with people. Um, yeah. Yeah, no. I'm not like No, I'm you. just I, saying, I mean... It's not my life. No. Yeah. Well, no, I, you know, Dylan's a nice guy. I sent him, I sent him a couple videos to watch. <laughs> I sent him a couple videos to watch and uh, I said, here, check these out, you know, but, uh, he, you know, w- when you hear people repeating these, these, uh, these Israel talking points, I think you got to... You got to push back on those. Hell yeah. And that's about it. <sighs> Ralph Nader, uh, he had a blog post uh, where he estimated that 200,000 people have died in Gaza. Mm-hmm. And people say, oh, well, he doesn't know what the fuck he's talking. But he's mm-hmm. like, he's a sober guy. Yeah. You know, he's a he's a smart guy. Yeah. And sure, maybe 200,000 is not the real number, but it's been at 30,000 dead since December. And that's yeah. because they've completely collapsed. Israel has yeah. the ability to count the dead. So we just don't know how many people are dead. And it's, I guarantee you, it's more than 30,000. Could it already be 100,000? Could be 200,000. That's a plausible upper bound estimate. And it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's very dispiriting and horrifying. Yeah, Here's what I would say to that, though. If you, does the, does the number matter w- with uh, some of the pictures and videos that we're seeing? On some level, yeah. But the, you're right in the sense that we don't know the real number. It's been yeah. at 30,000 since December. But we know it's a lot. And we know it's, it's a lot of dead kids, yeah. You know? If one if one kid gets run over with a tank, that's one too many. Yeah. I guess I just love children more than you fucking freaks do, though. More than you, uh, you know, whatever. Anyway, I guess, I guess we said our piece. Okay, so we watched The Octopus Murders yeah, it's on Netflix. American Conspiracy, The Octopus Murders, directed by Zachary Treats mm-hmm. and his friend Christian Hansen, who's a photojournalist. And, uh, that's fun, but that's a lot of pressure, I think, having that name. 
Christian Hansen? No. <laughs> Christian Hansen. Which is Zachary Treats. <laughs> yeah. Try it. Yeah, because people expect you to show up with candy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> Just because my name is Zachary Treats <laughs> and I brought candy that one time, <laughs> I don't always have candy on me. <laughs> um, so I want to I want to ask you guys though what was your what was your like overall reaction to the the documentary the Netflix documentary the Octopus Murders? Well, one I didn't watch it until this morning, and last uh-huh. night I told someone I was watching. Uh, I'm like, yeah, I'm watching the Octopus, the documentary, the Octopus. And uh, did you watch the wrong documentary? And, no, but the person was like, and I didn't know what the documentary was about mm-hmm. yet. Mm-hmm. And the person was like, oh, I watched that a few years ago, and it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, like everybody knows octopuses are like the smartest, and so it's sad at the end, but at least he's like back in the ocean. And I was like, oh, okay. And then I started like, <laughs> like on the ride home, started listening to YouTube shit about how octopuses are smart. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And then I woke up this morning. I was like, I'll just worry about it this morning. Yeah. Uh, and then thank God I looked at the text because mm-hmm. I'm like, something's off. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so now we're here. That would be funny if you just jump in at any time with octopus knowledge. Knowledge, yeah. Yeah, yeah that'd be sick. I mean, feel free because you <laughs> probably learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. We are going to do, let us let us know. We do want to do like an animal episode of the show. So uh, comment on, if you're on Patreon, comment uh, your favorite animals, your favorite uh, animal facts. Um, I did go to the Museum of Natural History a couple weeks ago. That was very nice. My kid and my wife. So, uh, you yeah, know, we didn't have time. I didn't have time to research walruses. You see one of those whales is coming back. What's that? After 200 years, they saw one of those ex- one of those whales we've made extinct. A, oh, gra- yeah. a gray yeah. whale in the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, yeah. Oh. And they've seen, oh, they've also seen gay whales. They've seen humpback whales. Wasn't that a big story? I don't know. I don't know. There's male humpback whales. Having sex, they were probably they probably learned it from a woke uh, boat. Yeah, <laughs> they probably picked up the behavior. Well, actually, you from, know, scientists from Colin Joe's part, boat party from a yacht party. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, scientists observed uh, two male humpback whales making another male humpback whale suck their dick so they could become a famous comedian. <laughs> also on Patreon, we got a lot of we got a lot of teasers for the Patreon, um, but we will get into that. We will get into a certain blind item from a comedian named Matt Reif. <laughs> he sucks two dicks simultaneously. Dude, if anybody needs a social media manager or like a PR person, yeah. you know, we should start a GoFundMe for his for, for his Matt PR. Reif. Yeah. Yeah, we just need like a like a cooler guy. Yeah. To be like, you don't need to overreact. Yeah. yeah. So Sean, what were your what were your like initial reactions to the documentary? Um, I recommend the first three episodes. That's four episodes. You can just skip the last one because it's, you know, the the first three go through generally the story of Danny Casolaro, which we'll go through briefly here today. Mm-hmm. Um, the fourth one is more just like, yeah, don't worry about conspiracies, man. Just focus on your life, you know? This stuff doesn't, you know, it, it's I watched, it's a real cop yeah. out. Yeah. I watched all four parts. I go, oh, here we go yeah. towards the end. Yeah. You know? The they implied that uh, maybe he maybe he did commit suicide, right? Um, you know, and that maybe our brains make connections with dots. Maybe we we try to connect dots that aren't really there, right? And I'm here to tell you, it's perfectly fine to alienate all your family and friends yeah. with conspiracy theories. Yeah, you should completely go down the rabbit hole. Yeah, and anyone who tells you not to is CIA. We'll always be here for you. Five dollars a month, Patreon.com, Out for Smokes podcast. We respond to comments. We you can DM us. Um, there's a certain tier. I think Mm -hmm. we'll Zoom call with you, maybe if we have time for it. Yes. And, um, and, uh, yeah, why not? Mm -hmm. It's fun. And we're going to, we should do an episode on, uh, on some, some African American conspiracy theories as well. Like they invented AIDS, which I kind of, you know, I'm agnostic on, but I could be convinced. Yeah. And that, uh, that they killed Bernie Mac. Oh yeah. That's just one of mine. No, I've I've seen you know videos of that. Really, shade room. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> After watching the Bernie Mac show. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So so yeah. I just really thought that that. I mean, we'll get into this later, but I really thought that the last episode just kind of falls apart completely. It was it was convoluted, sort of like on purpose. Um. 
Well, that's the thing. So the two the two people are uh, uh, the director, Zachary Treats, his friend Christian Hansen, has apparently been obsessed with the story since 2011, 2012. And they decided to make a documentary out of it. Like he follows his friend and his friend was originally going to write a book to finish what Danny Casolaro was writing about. Mm-hmm. And um, it's weird where the fourth episode feels like such a cop out that I'm like, I don't know if you get, do you just do that to protect yourself, to be like famous? To ha- Cause that's like, you see a lot of this stuff with these ne- Netflix conspiracy documentaries. Like mm-hmm. they did a really awful one about the anthrax attacks, mm-hmm. which is a complete cover up. Like, you know, it could be manufactured by NSA, CIA, whoever. Yeah. Uh, but they'll the Netflix documentaries about conspiracies will start out with like really interesting, intriguing stuff suggesting an inside job. And then by the time you get to the end, it's like, oh, who really knows? You know, it probably was suicide. And, you know, yeah. you got to focus on your own life. And like the anthrax one, for example, it originally it starts out by positing this was a domestic. Actually, I don't have to focus on my own life. Exactly. Actually, I make uh, a, a, a mailman's weekly salary. <laughs> Focusing on conspiracy theories, yeah, every month. That's right. Yeah. Um, so, so why don't you, yeah, worry about yourself? Yeah. Well, like the anthrax ones, for example, uh, the after nine eleven, there were these anthrax attacks. Um, the I believe six people died, and it was very obviously a domestic conspiracy by the U.S. Some element of the U.S. government. The anthrax that was used is like highly weaponized. Anthrax is a bioweapon. You need like an actual lab to weaponize it Mm -hmm. uh, to the purity that was used in the attacks. It couldn't have, there's no place it could have come from except for a U.S. government bioweapons lab. Mm -hmm. And then eventually they framed this guy, Bruce Ivins, uh, who committed suicide shortly before he was going to be charged or something or, you know, murdered suicide, who knows. Mm -hmm. But the Netflix documentary, it briefly like touches on that conspiracy stuff at the end and then it just kind of like goes into this like uh dramatization about bruce ivins being like this weird guy who like i guess he like uh collected used panties from some sorority he was obsessed with when he was in college or he was like a weird guy yeah but that doesn't change there's literally no physical there's not even any circumstantial evidence that links him to the crime he physically could not have mailed all those letters Mm -hmm. you know and so that's like kind of what i expect with netflix documentaries and unfortunately i was like really into this one at first and then by the fourth episode i'm like they fucking did it again yeah they do this every goddamn time yeah there's also a tendency, I think, to like focus on a couple people who who probably could just be um, sort of like fall guys, mm-hmm. you know, like they focus on a couple a couple um, figures who might have just done a couple of murders, but they don't really they you know they they briefly mention like Ronald Reagan and some of the higher ups in his administration, right. but they just they they more focus on uh, the actual. I guess whatever lower level people. Right. They won't tell you George H. W. Bush was having little boys trafficked into the White House. Yeah. You know, the real shit. Like yeah. Craig Spence. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta go to the Out for Smokes podcast to get that. <laughs> Cause you got the real story. They won't tell you that his 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 uh his dynasty was cut short by Donald Trump, our next president. Um, but Danny Casolaro, we did actually, uh, if you're a new listener, we did these, uh, the episodes CIA, a journalist probably killed by the CIA. We did uh, parts one, two, and three. And I, we covered Danny Casolaro a bit on part two. But I'll just, uh, I can give the, the brief story here. Danny Casolaro, August 10, 1991. He's found in a hotel, in a motel in Martinsburg, West Virginia, uh, both his, in a bathtub with both his wrists slit. And actually, his left wrist was cut eight times. His right wrist was cut four. Extremely deep cuts that sever the tendon. Like, if you sever your tendon, you can't move your arm at all. Mm-hmm. It's physically impossible. He could have killed himself like that. Mm-hmm. And also, somebody was in the room mopping up the blood. So I guess the official story is he, like, cut himself and then he like went and mopped up the blood and then put a bunch of blood up on the walls and stuff Mm -hmm. it doesn't make any sense at all what if he started slipping around in pain (laughs) you know that's possible it's like a prat fall well because he put a bag over his head too Mm -hmm. so if he you know you have to put the bag over your head first before you cut your arms so you can't even see there's a bag over your head now you can't see now you're starting to cut yourself yeah all of a sudden you're slipping on blood you don't know where anything is how would he have cut both his wrists 
I don't know. I've watched video of people slip both of their wrists, light themselves on fire, and jump off of a thing. I've just seen it. You've watched World's Funniest Suicide (laughs) Compilation? Yeah, these are like real videos on the internet. I think we've all Mm. seen people slip both wrists and then do a backflip into water. Well, I think we've And then say, welcome to (laughs) Jackass. Like, this is life. Scott, are you a fed? <laughs> Before we keep doing No, this I podcast. believe this man was murdered, but I don't think we have to sit here and, and uh, go, T- two arms cut? Like, yes, that is possible, but I do. I still think he was murdered. He just said if you cut the tendon, you can't raise your arm. I know. Okay, go it's, ahead. There are deeper cuts than, um, than, than I think you could ever do on a suicide. And, you know, again, he'd had a lifelong fear of blood and needles. He told his brother, if anything happens to me, it's not an accident. Um Two days before, it would take two days for his family to get notified, and then uh, his body would be embalmed without permission, which makes it harder to do an autopsy. Yeah. Um, And, you know, it's just like, and all that, oh, yeah, and then he had this brown briefcase that he was frequently photographed with where he had all his notes for this book and the story he was working on. Uh, That just disappears. None of his notes are ever found. And, you know, later a woman identifies another man who does not match his description, enter, entered his hotel room that night. That other man was a military intelligence, it matches the description of a military intelligence guy um, uh, named what, Joseph something, Joseph Kuehler. Now, is that the same guy she said was at the bar? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, and... Uh, that he identified to her as a military guy, right? Yeah. yeah. Danny Casolaro would meet with some source who's a military intelligence guy uh, who seemed to too good to be true, just kind of like goes over to him at a bar, introduces himself, seems to have like all this information about the story he's working on. Mm-hmm. Um, would later, Joseph Kuehler would later threaten his ex-girlfriend to stop asking questions about Danny Casolaro, says that, or else she'll, that she has two kids and that she's got to think about her two kids so she doesn't end up like Danny or this, he names this other journalist who was murdered in Guatemala, Anton New. I believe his name was. He was working on the BCCI story. And I'm sorry, like, you know, and that's the documentary filmmakers in any podcast about conspiracy, they do kind of run into this where a lot of names, a lot of moving pieces. And, uh, but I, I think if you stack the, so we'll we'll try to keep it clear, but I think if you stack the evidence, it's pretty, pretty obvious. Well, it did kind of feel like they, <clears throat> they tried to convolute the story on purpose. Right. Or there's something about they really kind of like true crimeified it. Yeah. Where they were trying to like build up this mystery and like re- you know reveal certain things, but it's but but I think if you if you just kind of say what happened, that's interesting. Yeah, they told it really poorly. Yeah. It's like the end of episode three should have been the first twenty minutes, mm-hmm. and now I'm invested. Mm-hmm. But you're making me invested in something, and then you jump to something else, and mm-hmm. you don't acknowledge the other thing. Fifty minutes later, it's just, mm-hmm. it was made poorly. It's a really interesting topic. But and they also tried to scare you with the Italian guy. <laughs> they they introduced this that character Michael Conosciuto. Oh yeah yeah go, yeah, an unsavory character <laughs> named. <laughs> Michael cannoli face Conosciuto. <laughs> like, oh, I see what you're doing here. Well, you yeah. dirty f- fucks. Yeah, you're right. No, I so I talked to uh, you know, parapolitics researchers, conspiracy theorists, but like people who are serious researchers mm-hmm. and are kind of dismissed by the mainstream or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and generally it's a split where it's like these kinds of things are good in that they get a lot of people who wouldn't normally hear about this stuff to hear about it. But they had a lot of problems with, like, Michael Reconosciuto is an un- unreliable narrator, which mm-hmm. they acknowledge in the documentary. He lies a lot, and that they they use some of his story to make their narrative mm-hmm. in, in ways that don't seem accurate. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I can just run through the story of what Danny Kessler was actually working on, which is the Promise software. Uh, Department of Justice, back in 1979, they buy Promise software from this company called Inslaw, um, and, uh, in 1979, this was like a real revolutionary software because you could track all, uh, department of justice files. You could find any defendant with like multiple cases, you know, cross. You could send and- so many more black teenagers to jail. Yes. So much more quicker. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you know, like everything we kind of take for granted about computerized databases now at 1979, this was like revolutionary, you know, they, before then, uh, prosecutors working for the Department of Justice would like just go through the office and they would like find out that the guy they had a case against had some other pending case, you know, just from talking to people and that, cause you know, the, the records weren't like digitized and easily searchable. So 
Inns Law sells this software promise to the Department of Justice in 1979. They originally, it's just a pilot program to install this software in 20 U.S. attorney's offices. Um, and things seem to be going well, but then two years into it, the Department of Justice just stops paying them. Like, they bought this software, and then they just stopped paying. And Inns Law was uh, founded by this guy, Bill Hamilton, and he gets a letter, an official letter from, like, the uh, the uh, the Canadian government, like, what, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, uh, the Canadian police force. They sent him a letter being like, hey, we've been using your promise. Could you provide, like, a French translation? Because we have to have all our software in both English and French because it's Canada. And he's like, I never authorized any sale to Canada. And that's when he finds out the Department of Justice has pirated his software and started selling it to all these different countries. And uh, so he goes to court with the Department of Justice and they're like, what? he and others are trying to figure out why don't they just pay, you know, the six point eight million or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's not that much money for the federal government. And the documentary and Danny Casalaro and most people have kind of theorized the reason they didn't pay it is because the software was, you know, first pirated and sold by the Department of uh, by people within the U.S. government, mm -hmm. but then they put a backdoor in. Mm -hmm. Like, they were using Promise because it was, at the time, you know, uh, early 80s, so revolutionary and so ahead of its time that every government wanted it. Yeah. So they would sell it to all these different governments, but then the intelligence services, CIA, NSA, whoever, they had the idea, well, we could just put, like, a backdoor into it, and we could read everything that they're doing with it. Like, we could see what they're using it to look up, you know, it's it's like a treasure trove for any intelligence agency. It's what they, like, tell parents TikTok is, right? Basically, yeah. yeah. Um, but so, yeah, that's like... Yeah, it's $6 million. I mean, to the federal government, that's like... That's like a thousand mandatory gender reassignment <laughs> surgeries, right? Yeah. It's like nothing. Yeah. That's like 600 Obama phones. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so yeah, Inslaw sues the Department of Justice. Uh, a federal bankruptcy judge orders the Department of Justice to pay six point eight million for stealing this. But then this depart this federal bankruptcy judge gets removed or replaced with one of the Department of Justice attorneys from the Inslaw case. The victory for Inslaw is reversed on appeal because they say Inslaw pursued it in the wrong court. This goes like all throughout until the late nineties when the government finally wins. Inslaw is kind of forced into is is forced into bankruptcy, and. Um, so Danny Casolaro was for more than a decade like a computer journalist. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he again, this is from from the 70s or yeah, no, from the uh, from the 80s. So Danny Casolaro gets on this case in like 1990 and then since 1980, he's been a computer uh, journalist, which is at a time when this was much more specialized uh, field. So um, he knew a lot about software. And he kind of uh, met Bill Hamilton, the founder of Inslaw, who just, you know, had his software stolen. And they started talking like every day. And Danny starts digging and digging into the story and eventually, you know, certainly wound up murdered. Um, the documentary tries to reconstruct some of the things that he found there. And they do an okay job of it. Yeah, they <clears throat> they didn't really connect the dots. Mm-hmm. I don't know, because yeah, and then and then the the documentary ends with um, this guy Michael Conosciuto calling the filmmakers and being like, "It's Michael, I need you to come here right now. Yeah, someone and cut my hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the worst haircut. <laughs> which is like, which is like for a documentary like that, that's like a, the end of an episode, and then you go, oh, I have to start the next one. Right. But yeah. that that was just the end of the entire. Because like, are they going to do more, or this is the entire? Yeah, dude, he's the new Honey Boo Boo. Are they doing an, another series? A season? I think this is it. Because, yeah, I mean, you know. Yeah. The ending is, oh, just go fucking kayaking. Yeah. Don't worry about the government murdering this guy. I first. mean, it seems like they did that on purpose, and I definitely lost interest in... I definitely lost interest in, in uh, the story. Yeah. There's that part where they go to the lady's house and they talk about the bowling alley. I just completely <laughs> zoned out. Yeah, it's like Netflix can't give you one minute of entertainment without wasting at least 20 seconds of your yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The end of every episode was uh, shit, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. it, it, because it started uh, the next episode, it never paid off not once. Mm -hmm. Never once mm -hmm. did the excitement of the end of an episode pay off. Yeah. That by the second episode, I was just like, this is 
ass. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. When you go to purgatory, you get to rewatch all the years of your life that Netflix wasted. Yeah. With their fucking panning Making shots. Making you feel bad for Stephen Avery. Yeah. <laughs> their fucking their panning shots. Yeah. 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 Or the yeah, or the yeah. people sitting down for the interview. That's the most annoying. <laughs> Dude, They're like getting the microphone right. Like yeah. Fucking kill yourself. <laughs> I've got places Hacks. to be. Yeah. 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 I know. You don't need to do any of that stuff. I know. No, there's so much fucking exposition and setup that it's all unnecessary to make every Netflix yeah. documentary be seven hours instead of the yeah. 45 you just, minutes it should have you been. You need a narrator who's in a trench coat walking around in a graveyard at night, and he slowly explains things while mm-hmm. reenactments are, you know, that's mm-hmm. it. A yeah. half hour thing. Yeah. They had the formula. Yeah, it's a lot of extra stuff. But they all kind of look the same, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like you said, the track, the tracking shots and the... Um, and then they, what did you say? The flyover, the shots? best parts are shots, an obviously yeah. mentally ill guy. Yeah. The what? The best parts are an obviously mentally ill guy. Like any right. documentary or reality type of thing that doesn't, you know. Yeah. little side note. Did you see Janine Janine? No. It's that, it's a document. It's like a 2002 documentary about the Janine refugee camp. It's on YouTube. We'll link it, but very good documentary and very simply done. Just wanted to hmm. shout out that documentary. Yeah, so the um, uh, Octopus documentary, they talk a lot about this guy, Earl Bryan, mm-hmm. who's a, a Reagan cabinet member who set up this company called Hadron Incorporated. He tried to buy Inslaw. Mm-hmm. Bill Hamilton says somebody from the company threatened him in 1983 because he didn't want to sell. And he, he, they said, quote, we have ways of making you sell, mm-hmm. unquote. Um Apparently, Danny Castellaro found that there were offshore payouts to Earl Bryan and other Department of Justice uh, members. Um, Because it's like, basically the documentary alleges that the October surprise, which is where Ronald Reagan's campaign, and this is confirmed, it's not a conspiracy theory anymore. uh, Ronald Reagan's campaign through uh, his campaign manager, Bill Casey, who later became his CIA director, they uh, made a deal with the Iranians to keep the hostages in Iran, the U.S. hostages, until after Reagan won the election. Then they released them. And this Mm -hmm. was, you know, a a money and weapons deal. Mm -hmm. Um, So basically the documentary... Kind of takes Michael Riconosciuto's story of this, which most people tell me is not credible, where he says like he actually went over there with Earl Bryan and they made payments of forty million. Most people I talk to say no, Michael Riconosciuto. You think the not, Italian guy's not credible? No, he's not credible. Well, he's like he he lies frequently, which they even acknowledge, oh, okay. acknowledge in the documentary, right? Because all Italian people lie. Yeah, yeah. He didn't look at very Italian. Well, his name's pretty Italian. It's funny. When you see him in the documentary, you like know he's in prison and you see take one look at him and you're like, child porn, right? <laughs> yeah. No, it's manufacturing meth. <laughs> yeah, you really get... But he he got 26 years he, for that? He looks yeah. like Danny DeVito doing Mo from the Three Stooges. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he got 26 years. And it's like, okay, so Michael Riconosciuto, he's like a genius. He went to Stanford when he was 16. He made an Argon laser, like at the time. It was, in 1972, he was arrested. Now he's a genius when it's convenient. <laughs> well, what is he, Sean? Is he a genius or a liar? Well, you can. He's very Alex Jonesy to me. Mm-hmm. Um, even like his origin, right? Wasn't his father uh, some sort of working in lobby? Working with the Fed? Oh, yeah, right? Yeah. 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 Oh, I yeah. heard things at the dinner table that most people never hear type of guy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like, so Earl Bryan was the connected Reagan cabinet guy, and he clearly ended up with the Promise software, but they alleged this was like payback to get him something for helping out with the October surprise, mm. which I don't know how true that part is. But mm-hmm. regardless, yeah, he's one of the people who does end up with the software. Um, was the Iran hostage situation like one of the main factors that got Reagan elected? Yeah, it was a big part of it. And it's very interesting, you know, um, they kind of gesture towards this, but um, uh, David Rockefeller was like heavily involved in Chase Bank. Peter uh-huh. Dale Scott has written about this. Jimmy Carter, uh, so the Shah of Iran gets overthrown and he's like just kind of going around the world because he doesn't have a, uh, he's staying in different countries. He had to flee Iran and they want like David Rockefeller and some of the other like very high up people want Jimmy Carter to allow the Shah to come to the United States to get medical treatment and reside there. And Jimmy Carter's resisting because, of course, he knows as soon as the Shah enters the United States, they're going to take all those hostages at the U.S. Embassy. And basically enough pressure is put onto Jimmy Carter that he relents and the hostages get taken. Mm -hmm. And Peter Dale Scott wrote up very convincingly that um, uh, Chase Manhattan Bank was like up to its fucking eyeballs in debt with the Iranian government 
uh, you know, like loans to the Iranian government, and they want it to provoke this hostage crisis, David Rockefeller and, you know, the, the high ups at Chase Manhattan, because as soon as the hostage crisis happened, they could like cancel all their loans to Iran, seize all this Iranian property, mm -hmm. and not basically get bankrupted by a change of uh, Iranian government. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then, of course, the, uh, the keeping them in Iran through the election, that was a... Uh, what's called the October surprise. Right. And then right after Reagan was sworn in, they... They all released. get released, yeah. Yeah. And they think there was like a bribe to the... I mean, they know. At this point, right. it's right. like, it's confirmed in the New York Times that uh -huh. this was done. Uh -huh. But, it, you know, it's been around. It's been a story that's been around for a while that's been kind of not really... It was dismissed as a conspiracy theory, but at this point, you know, survivors have talked. I mean, yeah. it's, it's something that happened. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, it's whatever. Um, but yeah, Michael Reconosciuto, in 1972, he was arrested for making PCP in an underwater lab. You had to like wear scuba gear to get there. And uh, for whatever reason, he's like out of jail. His skills are in demand. He, uh, Michael is the guy who talks to Danny Casolaro and Bill Hamilton, the Inslaw guy. Uh, he, sa he mentions this, this corporation called the, the Wackenhut Corporation. He says he was head of research there. And he says... Uh, Michael Reconosciuto in March 1991 gives a sworn affidavit in support of the Inslaw case where he says, I worked for the um, the Wackenhut Corporation under the direction of Earl Bryan, the guy we just mentioned. I was told to put a backdoor into the Promise software so that it could be used to spy on people. And March 1991, he submits this sworn affidavit supporting Inslaw. He actually testifies to Congress about this. And then eight days after testifying, he's arrested by the DEA charged for conspiracy to distribute and manufacture meth and methadone. It's federal drug, drug charges. The documentary makers do point out the DEA is an arm of the Department of Justice, which is exactly who Inslaw was suing. So it does seem pretty motivated. And he gets 26 years. He's released in 2017, which is always like, it's always one of those things where you see a guy like that who's very clearly lying about things and you're wondering what's his angle because mm -hmm. it's like they already put you in prison for 26 years mm -hmm. like why do you still have loyalty to them but it's like i guess they could always kill you i guess mm -hmm. you have you know maybe they make you some promises some guarantees somebody says something mm -hmm. that if you kind of play along with this but spread particular parts of disinformation mm -hmm. like another fascinating thing is they uh they talk about this guy robert booth nichols and he like shows some other journalist like altered footage of the Kennedy assassination that has yeah. his driver shooting him. Yeah, it's like a Bill <laughs> Hicks bit. Yeah. yeah. It's like, I mean, it's completely fake. Right. But that is something they do is you do like if you get into con Kennedy assassination conspiracies, there are people who kind of spread this bullshit about, oh, the driver shot him or, oh, somebody within the sewer grate shot him or Jackie shot him. And, and you know, and it's like. This stuff is just complete nonsense, but it's meant they do put or you know nine eleven for example. They try to cloud the narrative. Yeah, nine eleven. They they were using plasma energy weapons. Right. Could it be aliens. a scare tactic though? Like, could right. that have happened to her? But it's a scare tactic. Right. It's possible too. I mean, because I've you know I've watched the the um the security or whatever the secret service member turned around and shot him like that theory that oh, they yeah, said yeah. he showed an and all it is is they just play the video and make you focus on him and right. it kind of looks like that that's all that happens yeah know? so if a guy is saying that trying to freak you out you'd be like holy fuck what am i seeing for the first time even though you've <laughs> yeah. seen it every time yeah yeah oh. um but yeah so it's like and again earl Bryan uh uh supposedly directed michael Reconosciuto to put this back door and he speaks farsi and he might have gone to iran he might have transferred 40 million to the new iranian government but um Michael Reconosciuto says he went with him, and I that absolutely did not happen, mm -hmm. uh, according to people I talked to who know more than me about this subject. But regardless, you know. So what was Reconosciuto's involvement in the in the whole thing? He was developing some of the weapons? Yeah, I mean, you know, he was clearly a smart guy. And another thing people talked about is, uh, well, why would the NSA need this fucking guy who's been arrested, you know, for PCP manufacturer to put a backdoor in the Promise software? Yeah. But I think that it is it is possible that Michael Reconosciuto did that. I mean, somebody did it. Mm -hmm. It's possible it was Mike Recon Reconosciuto who did it because, again, 1980, there's just not as many computer programmers as there are now. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, today, yeah, the NSA has an army of computer programmers to do this kind of thing. Right. Back in the day, it's a more specialized field. And also, right. especially when, again, what they're doing is illegal. Right. It is, it is it was more, like a podcast producer in 2013. <laughs> yes. 
it is more convenient to have um, uh, somebody who can be trusted, who you have leverage over mm -hmm. to do this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, so he says, Michael Reconosciuto says he put this back door in at the Cabazon Indian Reservation in California. Now, this is another, like, interesting part of the documentary, just the whole story, is this Indian Reservation, the Cabazon. It's, um, it's in California. Yeah, near Just one in question about the Inslaw software. So what? So what they wanted to do was sell the software to other countries, but it would have a backdoor in it, so, so that they could they spy. Could spy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They uh, apparently went all over the world. Like they sold it to like Syria and Iraq and stuff, and yeah. you know Israel, of course. And do other empires do shit like that, or is it only whitey? Probably. I mean, I, it's yeah. just like it's just such modern technology mm -hmm. where. You know, the ability to backdoor software, that was completely new at the time. Right. In terms of, uh, yeah. I'm, tr I'm trying to think of a comparable example from history, but I can't that would really. Be like, that would be like me doing a moving job for somebody and putting cameras in all their stuff. <laughs> and it's just so grimy. It's very Chuck Berry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you just watch him take shits. Yeah. Sell it on the internet. The CIA. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Chuck Berry was working for the CIA. Yeah. So really the money is in selling videos of women going pee pee and poo poo. It's not in the actual moves themselves. <laughs> yeah. Mike shows up wearing like Gucci nice. loafers. <laughs> yeah. Did nice. another move today. Still overcharge them for the move. <laughs> yeah. I made 200 on the move, but you get it on the back end with the cameras of <laughs> women shitting. <laughs> In their two bedroom apartment. <laughs> Just you, could, you buy this from the website. It's called Mike's Videos of Women Shitting dot com. <laughs> <laughs> you you upload them all on an Indian reservation, so it's, <laughs> yeah, so it's legal. It's technically legal, yeah. Right. I tell the tribe like, hey, we're gonna make a lot of money from videos of women from Mike's Videos of Women Shitting dot com. If I can just open up my office here. Yeah, and the Cabazon Indian Reservation, this guy, John Philip Nichols, uh, is like very much obviously a CIA guy. Well, I'll give him his bio in a second. But he um, he comes up with this idea, or somebody at the agency or whoever comes up with this idea of, let's go out in uh, 1978. He moves to the Cabazon Indian Reservation with his family. At the time, there were just 20-something members. I believe now there's just 38 members of the Cab Cabazon Indian Reservation. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, it's near Indio, California. And the idea that he or whoever came up with was, oh, if we do it on sovereign tribal land, federal and state law doesn't really apply there, or at least state law. Like, no, no California authorities will bother us. So he comes up with the idea, he, like, shows up, and uh, says like, "Hey, I'll pay you guys ten thousand a month." I have like so he says he has some government grant. He never explains like where or what this money's coming from. But he says like, "Yeah, I'll pay you guys ten thousand a month." And then he comes up with uh, the they set up smoke shops like to sell cigarettes, no tax. They set up alcohol shops, sell alcohol, no tax. And they actually set up the first uh, tribal uh, poker casino uh, to you know do gambling. In at the time, violation of California state law, and this would go all the way to the Supreme Court, and eventually, in like 1987, they'd win. So, kind of an interesting part of this story is like whatever CIA operation this was, also helped um, Native American tribes get the casinos. Like that just wasn't a thing until eventually the Cabazons won in the Supreme Court because California was saying, "Hey, you can't be doing gambling here," and the Supreme Court said, "No, they they can. It's sovereign land." Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> or either that, or they said California wanted a cut, and the Supreme Court told them to fuck off. Uh, whatever the ruling. <clears throat> but so yeah, John Phillips Nichols. But so they were altering the the promise software on this Cabazon land, but they were also doing like drug and gun running. They were just kind of doing every sort of illegal thing you could think of. And John Philip Nichols, and was, they weren't even sharing the money with the with the tribes. Yes, people. no, they were murdering them instead of doing that. Yeah, it was very unfortunate. Um, John Philip Nichols is this guy. He was working for Jimmy Hoffa in the 1950s, and Hoffa, of course, is mobbed up. He got a federal warrant. John Philip Nichols was arrested in the 1950s, and then somehow is let go, and he gets to bring his whole family to Brazil to Rio de Janeiro in 1959 which is shortly before there's a CIA coup there. And then he brings his family to Chile in 1965. Also, uh, he's an evangelical leader there who rallies peasants to vote against uh, Salvador Allende. 
And he does all this like shortly, well, a few years before there's a CIA coup there, but it's like kind of weird where he keeps right. moving places. Uh, apparently a, a, a high up member of the Milwaukee mob was his son's godfather, according to, um, according to his uh, son's uh, birth certificate. And later when they set up the poker uh, casino at the Cabazon land, a bunch of organized crime figures go and work there. And his son is interviewed in the documentary and explains it like, well, who else knows how to run a casino <laughs> right. but the mobsters, you know? Uh, but so that's just an interesting connection between organized crime and intelligence. Um, but yeah, so he's like traveling a lot. They give his whole travel itinerary all throughout the 60s. He's like doing all these kind of very shady, very obviously CIA, whatever. I like in the documentary, all his kids refuse to talk to the filmmakers except his one shithead son. <laughs> his one... 50-year-old son with a ponytail. Hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so he's moving until 1978. He comes to Cabazon. He sets up shop there. Smoke shop, tax-free alcohol, first Native American poker room. The mob comes in. They start running the casino. And then Fred Alvarez is the head of security for the tribal council. And he doesn't like that this, the tribe isn't seeing much of the money. And he believes correctly that uh, John Philip Nichols is embezzling. He's stealing from the tribe instead of sharing it like he said he would. And he actually like breaks into the office, Fred Alvarez does, and he gets documents that show this, but also that show that, you know, the Wack and Hut Corporation, which is this uh, we just mentioned, but it's a very spooky, like intelligence connected um, corporation that does security for nuclear plants. Uh, apparently did security for Area 51. It's got all sorts of like CIA, NSA on the board. But he, he finds that they're doing very weird weapons manufacturing there. They're apparently doing biological and chemical weapons manufacturing there. And Fred Alvarez is murdered execution style along with two friends in 1981. And that was, you know, certainly ordered by John Philip Nichols. But he's, you know, he died and was never convicted of it. Mike, we're the two friends if they kill Sean. <laughs> Mm, that's a good question. I mean, hopefully, uh, I don't know. Some Tinder date? Yeah, I'll get killed along with the one friend I have. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I mean, hopefully it's not you and me. Yeah, no, I agree. It won't be. It is. It, I, I was thinking about that. If we got threatened to stop doing this podcast. Mm-hmm. And then Sean refused to by the listeners. They, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They'll be like, "It was they a sue sewer," us for, and then we jump into like, suicide for sure. They, yeah, we know. They sue us for wasting their time. <laughs> um, I mean, we're giving you four hours of a Netflix documentary in thirty minutes. So yeah, we are saving you oh, time. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Right. What would the podcast be though if they took out Sean? Who I don't know. It'd be like a cooking show. <laughs> <laughs> That'd have to be like a cooking show or something. Yeah, and I'd just be chewing the whole time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what's crazy is the Wack and Hunt Security Company, they're now called G4S Secure Solutions. Mm -hmm. The Pulse nightclub shooter Omar Matten worked for them. Really? Yeah. Damn. And that's one of those, you know. So it's a bunch of closeted homosexuals <laughs> that work there? Mostly. Oh, damn. His dad was like FBI too. There's a bunch of weird stuff with that story. Really? Yeah, maybe another episode we could... <laughs> but what but but what are they trying to accomplish when they when they do that when they do a mass shooting yeah create chaos uh, yeah take our guns away <laughs> they've Fear? been trying <laughs> sean's nodding his head yeah. <laughs> yeah, <Sean. laughs> um yeah but it, it's not it's not working you think they're just they're just trying to do a lot of them like, you th do you think they were like, all right, surely Sandy Hook will get their guns taken away? <laughs> they probably did. <laughs> there probably was a CIA meeting. And they're yeah. like, these fucking animals don't even care. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like putting out clips. They're like, eventually we'll get them. We'll get them. They're like yeah. crying. Like, how many of our, uh, how many of your kids are you going to make us kill? Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. But anyway, so whatever the story there, the uh, Wackenut Security Company, uh, very spooked up. Let me just ask you real quick, has has Gaza made any of your political alignment sort of like change or have, has there been any kind of, um, have you felt like maybe you feel closer to certain people on the right perhaps that you haven't before? 
What the anti Semites? No, no. I mean, some of them on. are good on the issue. You can't you can't take that away from well, them. Well, some some libertarians have been pretty good, which I yeah, never thought I'd be. Libertarians are mostly good on foreign policy. Yeah. Um, um. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you probably always liked libertarians, though, man. Right? I mean, wasn't Ron Paul like a libertarian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think. I mean, during COVID, they were kind of annoying. Libertarians. Yeah, they were like, "Open the fuck the the." But then weren't Jesus they right? right I mean, can they were we admit right. they were right? Yeah. Like, were they? So, yeah, it's okay to admit we were wrong and they were right. I mean, yeah, believing yeah. in science for a few months is okay. You think there was but too we much? We were wrong. You think <laughs> yeah. there was, and science was lying to us because <laughs> science is owned. Yeah. Right. You think there was too much masking? I just think we didn't know what was going on, and so masking is fair. I get it, and but then I think at a point. Um, Became a little, you know. I don't look again. I don't know the full details. I, You're saying I don't there were a lot of overweight masking. women that liked the lockdowns. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know it, uh, enough, but yeah, yeah, I know, I know enough to to know something smells funny. Hmm. You're just you're, you're saying. I mean, I don't really, I don't care about this stuff at all. But yeah, no, no, I'm just saying, like, yeah. I mean, I'll talk about any of it. Like, it just is logical. Like, I don't know. There's like logical things. Like people go, like, the vaccine couldn't harm you. I go, no. Like, the vaccine could harm you, and not the vaccine could harm you. You know, like, COVID is bad, and sometimes vaccines have adverse effects, especially when they're brand new. Like, no, I would say they have to have adverse effects if they're brand new for some people. Mm-hmm. Because all vaccines have adverse effects for some people. So to act like this is the coolest vaccine ever <laughs> makes you look crazy, not me. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. all. Well, you know, they were right about the vaccines. We thought they were all safe, and it turns out they sterilize you, and that's why Mike can't have another kid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess that's true. I think Fauci should just, like, lean into that and mm-hmm. be like, no, you don't actually have to pull out anymore. You're welcome. <laughs> Go ahead and shoot ropes into your wife. What do you think, Mike, it's about, right. about it? About what? You always ask us about it, but then you never comment. Yeah, I don't really, like, know much about it. But you always it, used I to, like, like, yell at us. Did I? Yeah, you were a big cunt about it. <laughs> you don't remember? Oh, yeah, you guys I would have arguments. I, no, but I don't, I don't think I was a cunt about it. I just think that we both, we both don't really know anything. Yeah, I know, but I always said I, I don't know. And you were always like, they know. Like, you would actively say they know. Sure. Yeah. But I guess that, like, I don't know. My uncle. Why can't you a, just admit you were a little wrong? Um, because you were afraid of speaking out loud about something. No, because my my uncle's a doctor and he's like into the vaccine. I talked uh, to him for like five minutes. Oh, okay. So I was like, I guess I trust you. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, well, my friend Scott actually, we do the po- we do a podcast together. Yeah, but and he you was know, talking it's not to his just sister. Yeah. He was talking to his sister, and his sister was saying that some of the guys that she uh, yeah. uh, webcams for, they're, they're um, impotent now. <laughs> yeah, they can't get hard. And three of their friends, um, who they're in white supremacist yeah. message, they're boards no longer on, giving her five dollars. Um, they're chats. having har- they had heart attacks. <laughs> so what do you think of that? <laughs> uh. Yeah. 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 Just, you know, I think you're a pussy about some things. I'm a pussy about Yeah. Like, I think it's very obvious. It's a very obvious answer that, like, yeah, yeah, vaccines could be, like, could have adverse effects on people. Sure. And the fact that you refuse to, but you demand that your friends uh, talk talk about Gaza, because that's obvious to us. Right. I mean, come on. Let's be people that notice things. Yeah. (laughs) Are you vaccinated? (laughs) I'm vaccinated. (laughs) I got vaccinated. Yeah. It's. But if something went wrong, I'd go, oh, yeah. Like, that was part of it. I knew going into it mm-hmm. that something could go wrong. Mm-hmm. Wh- whoever went into it thinking nothing would go wrong yeah. is handicapped. Right. But nothing well, bad. yeah, because they got the vaccine. <laughs> nothing bad happened to you. You, you I just don't think it, right? That, yeah, I, yeah, 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 yeah. I would have lost my job. If I yeah, we all got it. And people lost it. I mean, that's terrible. Mm-hmm. You can't do that to people. Yeah. You can't demand people get a shot and or they lose their jobs. That's I crazy. Have, I would have lost my job at Cuck Dick Suckers Incorporated <laughs> if I didn't, <laughs> exactly. didn't get the vaccine. <laughs> no, but I think that both of us know very little about it. No, I know. You think people should have lost their jobs when they refuse to get it? I don't know enough. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's an easy question, it's an Mike. Easy question. No. You're just a pussy. <laughs> It's fine. I'm just saying don't walk into bars and yell at people who, you know, are, your, are supposed to be your friends in comedy. Who's yelling at But then anybody? it's like, you know, you're a pussy about stuff too. That's all I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You just got a, a DM from your ex-girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> are you sure? I'm, are you sure you're vaccinated? I'm pregnant. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> well, well, well. <laughs> oh. oh, look who's too much of a pussy to stop uh, having sex with his ex-girlfriend. No, we don't have sex. We're just friends. Yeah, yeah. That's good. <laughs> anyway, so this documentary, it's called American Crime, The Octopus Story. Or Sometimes American you got to make the stupid people fall in line, though, and you got to threaten their job <laughs> if they don't if they don't get the vaccine. I mean, I kind of do believe that, you know. Yeah, I know. I know. I do believe, believe you have yeah. to. You have to. And here he is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying I'm not stupid. I'm just yeah. saying sometimes you have to bend stupid people to your will. Yeah. You know, there was a girl having a full volume conversation on the subway because the train was delayed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you want to like, be able to snap be, your fingers and be I like, wanna, "Fauci, yes. vaccinator." <laughs> She just strokes out. <laughs> okay. Coming right up. I just, yeah, you're right. I want to take my home COVID vaccination kit and put it in her neck. It would be fun if there were like really was the Italian council that controlled the world. And that's mm-hmm. where Mike became pro vaccine because he just meets with Fauci. <laughs> There's like a hidden room in Grand Central. First of all, I'm not really like pro vaccine, but it's you're not I think I think some people think they're cool by being anti vaccine. Like I think I think you're just trying to be you're just trying I'm to I'm like not anti vaccine. I got the vaccine. Then why are you giving me shit about the vaccine? Because I, I you only shut up about it. Like you only don't say anything. And I go, why is Mike such a weird pussy about a thing that's like obvious? Mm-hmm. He acts like he gets everything. But it, then you don't. And I'm just curious. And I just want you to say it's because I'm being a pussy and not, oh, what because I, I don't a know. Pussy? What am I being a pussy about? Nothing. nothing. You know, they put a back door in the vaccine. <laughs> How am I a pussy? <laughs> nothing, Mike. Okay. Go ahead. They put a back door in the vaccine so they can read your mind if you're having gay sex. <laughs> if you're thinking about having gay sex. Now she can read your mind. Yeah, that's why that's, Scott, that's why that's Scott why they, didn't get it. They put the vaccine global so they I could figure out who's gay in every country. Oh, you got it. You're I got right. it twice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. But anyways, regardless, this Wagon Hut security company, they're working on the Cabazon Indian Reservation. There's apparently there's a demonstration of weapons there with Michael Reconosciuto, Earl Bryan, some Nicaraguan Contra generals from the Iran Contra thing uh, are there to, to watch like a demonstration of night vision goggles and machine guns. And they're also manufacturing machine guns and uh, night vision goggles, allegedly bioweapons, chemical weapons, as well as putting the back door in the promise software. They're doing all that on this fe- uh, this Cabazon Indian Reservation. And uh, after the security guy, uh, Fred Alvarez, is murdered, a lot more like CIA intelligence kind of people as well as organized crime people start coming through. And then in 1982 in San Francisco, Paul Maraska is murdered. And that's a fucked up one. They do talk about this in the documentary. It's pretty um, disturbing and compelling. They blame this guy, Philip Arthur Thompson who was a, a CIA hitman with an who was an FBI informant like they they allege in the documentary that he's linked to dozens of murders in California and they show a bunch of different news stories of these like murders and they say he was picked up on like several of them but he was always an FBI informant so he would just get cut loose and that's you know that's when we talk about these conspiracies, you'll see that a lot where people become DEA informants or FBI informants or, you know, uh, CIA contract uh, assets or whatever, where they're, you know, they're getting paid by the FBI or whatever. And if they're an informant, they want to keep them on the street. They want to protect them. And so you'll have this kind of blending where they can suddenly become a hitman who's useful for elements of the CIA or the FBI who just need somebody iced. And this guy, Paul Maraska, who's murdered in San Francisco uh, in January 1982, he's tortured. And what he did was, uh, who, Philip Arthur Thomas allegedly killed him, but whoever killed him, they put him in like this device that like strangled him. Uh, you know, it like tied his hands behind his back and his legs and it strangled him as soon as he like wasn't couldn't able move to his legs anymore. Yeah, couldn't move couldn't his legs his anymore, leg. which is like, oh man, that's horrible. But they tortured him to death. And the documentary goes through, Paul Marasco was heavily involved in the Cabazon Indian Reservation. He'd invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in it. And basically he was the money guy. He was handling all their offshore accounts. So the documentary says there was a meeting near his house where um, the, the head of this, John Philip Nichols, was at this meeting. And they probably decided, and also Philip Arthur Thompson was there. That's probably where they just told him, hey, go kill that guy, but torture him first because they drained all his bank accounts. So it's like, why did they kill him in such a horrific manner? They tortured him to be like, hey, give us you know, the access codes for all these bank accounts. Give us all the routing numbers and we'll let you live. And then they just killed him. And all the Swiss bank accounts get emptied. Hmm. Uh, 
the the casino apparently files for bankruptcy in 1981. So yeah, like uh, uh, the head John Philip Nichols definitely stole a lot of money and brought you know some partners in with him on that. Uh, but you know, so those are the uh, the octopus murders. Uh, though I did find it interesting. We mentioned on uh, the um, uh, journalist killed by the CIA part two another murder that was not mentioned in the documentary that I do sh- just want to say this guy, Alan David uh, Standoff, Standorf, Alan David Standorf. He was uh, an NSA guy who was talking to Danny, Danny Casolaro and uh, was giving him information about Promise Software. And uh, uh, he was beaten to death. Uh, yeah, blunt force trauma in the back of his head uh, when he was in his car at uh, Metropolitan Washington Airport. January 3rd, 1991. Somebody beats him to death or gives him blunt force trauma in the back of his head and kills him in his car. Uh, The Department of Justice is still citing a FOIA, Freedom of Information Act request, exemption on these files, on his files, 25 years later. So this is like, you know, another murder that's linked to uh, the octopus that's not mentioned in the documentary that I just wanted to say. One of Danny Castellaro's sources was killed just a few months before Danny Castellaro was killed. Jeez. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's basically it. I mean, I guess they also talk about this guy, Robert Booth Nichols, who becomes a source for Danny Casolaro, probably helped set him up to get killed. He retrofitted arms for the Contras. He was apparently like started a company with Michael Reconosciuto. Then they had a fall- falling out. He was at this weapons demonstration at Cabazon that I mentioned with the, uh, the Nicaraguan Contras. Uh, uh, he was, you know, he was also involved in BCCI, Nugent Hand, uh, or actually, sorry, forget that. He was involved in uh, money laundering. He was connected to the Gambino crime family. He grew up in a wealthy L.A. family. His dad was a renowned doctor. Apparently at 16, all the kids were given Porsches. Uh, but yeah, he retrofitted arms for the Contras. He was also probably CIA. He traveled internationally. He supposedly had a tourism business, but he was just traveling internationally all the time and nobody knew what his actual job was and his parents had apparently cut him off. So it's like, yeah, those kinds of, usually it's weapons, drugs, CIA, some sort of link, Yeah, you know. They did a good job of humanizing Danny Casolaro and talking to his family and like finding, you know, home movies of, of him, which... Uh, not that not that much exists, but they talk to his brother a lot, and his brother says, you know, the last time I saw Danny was at my son's third birthday party, and it's like, it's funny, because my kid's going to turn three in a couple months, and, uh, you know, it would suck if the CIA, like, took his uncle away. <laughs> like, an uncle's a very special relationship that kids have, you know, and, you know, imagine, like, you're three years old, and your uncle, your uncle gets killed. Yeah. No, and... um well, I agree with that, but I, I did also want to mention, you know, we we're talking about like conspiracy theories that are quote unquote conspiracy theories that are prominent in the African American community. Mm-hmm. They actually had this whole phenomenon they called like black paranoia, uh-huh. which is just kind of dismissing uh, a bunch yeah. of black Americans very accurately saying, no, the U.S. government is bringing drugs into our community. Yeah. The U.S. government was bringing heroin into the black community. Uh-huh. And then, of course, uh, Gary Webb would later reveal that uh, they were bringing the crack epidemic in. Uh-huh. And this was this, uh, they do- in How the, are they bringing it in, just from trucks? Well, the in the case of crack, they were bringing, uh, they were allowing the Contras in Nicaragua to sell cocaine. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it, mm-hmm. they'll, there's arguments as to the full extent of CIA involvement, but I believe they were wholly involved. Mm-hmm. At minimum, they were just kind of giving them a pass, but I think they were actually like actively bringing that in. And that's actually the, the documentary interviews this journalist, uh, Sherry Seymour. And she talks about how she was doing research in the 70s and 80s about drugs being brought into California with government sanction. And that eventually led her to the Cabazon Indian Reservation. Mm-hmm. So it's just like an interesting thing about this, these kind of, uh, let's say, uh, black ops or whatever. Mm-hmm. You'll have a group at the Cabazon Indian Reservation or wherever, and they're kind of, they have their fingers in everything. Mm-hmm. Like they're doing drug trafficking, they're doing weapons smuggling, they're, you know, arming the Contras, they're helping fund the Contras, um, they're training the Contras, you know. And another example would be Mena Airport in Arkansas, where they were um, uh, doing weapon smuggling, but yeah. also training the Contras there, also doing drug smuggling there. Yeah. So it's like, it's not like these black ops are like, this is just one thing you're doing. It's yeah. like they have these kind of networks mm-hmm. that have their fingers in all these different pies mm-hmm. and can be also used for murder for hire or whatever you kind of need. Uh-huh. Yeah. 
Now, what is the connect the dots with them bringing crack into the the black communities? I mean, I guess it like destabilizes and it stops pe- it stops them from organizing. That's like I think that's a knock on effect. Like obviously, the British used opium that way in mm-hmm. um, in in China, but I think it's like the initial incentive is just make money. Mm-hmm. But then you kind of realize. You know, it's not like there's some big plan. So there's individual CIA guys making money yeah. from bringing crap. Like into John it. Philip Nichols, yeah. yeah. Like he obviously became very rich. Yeah. Um, but you know, Get I don't a fucking job. I don't think there's even like that much of a plan. I think it's like, oh, nobody care, you know, white America as a whole doesn't yeah. really care about these communities. Yeah. But then they did the same shit with fentanyl and heroin, with just the US heroin epidemic. And what mm-hmm. we learned is like now, people just don't care about drug addicts. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like even if it's white suburban kids, mm-hmm. 100,000 dead every year. Yeah. Like people just blame, you know, they people blame drug addicts. Yeah. Uh, instead of the supplier and whatever. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the documentary does kind of oversimplify because they say Danny Casolaro named eight people as being part of the octopus, which were John Philip Nichols, George Pender, Tom Kleins, Ted Shackley, Howard Hunt, Richard Helms, Ray Klein, and George H.W. Bush. Oh, I think Bill Casey, too. Anyways, but I, I talked to people, and they said Danny Castellaro himself, he actually kind of changed, the members of the octopus changed depending on what he was talking about. It wasn't as simple as just he said, these eight people are the octopus. But it does kind of illustrate something where what he said was, these are guys who have like CIA or OSS, the, uh, the predecessor to the CIA. They have connections to that intelligence world and also connections, some of them, to the underworld mm-hmm. or to the business community. And the idea was this was kind of a network of we can operate outside of the government and influence things in every part of the U.S. government. Mm-hmm. And this is how Peter Dale Scott defines the deep state is those linkages between organized crime, big business, and government. And so it, it makes a lot of sense to say, like, here's this network of guys that all know each other and they all hang out and they have, all of them have tentacles that reach to different places. So they can always call a meeting and if we need somebody killed or we need money to fund this Contra war or we need something else or, you know, we're selling the promise software or whatever, they can kind of uh, uh, exert their will in a way that obviously you can't if you're just staying within the government. Mm -hmm. So these kind of networks that just blend in, that come in and out of the government, Mm -hmm. but ultimately supersede its power. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Well, any uh, any final thoughts? No, no. It's I'm, it's an amazing thing. I think it's real. I think it's real for sure. And uh, you don't gotta watch the documentary. Yeah. There's articles um, that are definitely just as captivating. Yeah, I mean, check out the first three episodes if you if you want to. But um, yeah, that's what we that's what we want to do for you guys. Hopefully, connect connect some of these dots. Yeah. You know. And yeah, I mean, so Danny Castellaro, he's, uh, he goes to West Virginia to meet this source, apparently in Martinsburg, uh, West Virginia, where he dies. The IRS had a computer data center, and the documentary alleges Robert Booth Nichols, who I just mentioned, the other shady CIA guy Danny was talking to, he set up a meeting for Danny with a source from the IRS, probably in, you know, Martinsburg, related to the IRS computer data center. He kind of baits him out there. And then Joseph Kuehler, this military intelligence guy who struck up a conversation with Danny at a bar, uh, a witness identifies a man uh, entering room 517, which was Danny's room. Uh, the witness says it was not his man. It was not the man in the news coverage, Danny Castellaro, because Danny Castellaro had like bright blonde hair, mm-hmm. and she says this witness had dark hair. Mm-hmm. And uh, Joseph Kuehler is matches his description. The documentary, like the one interesting thing in um, in episode four, is they get access to the Martinsburg uh, Police Department files, which have been under seal forever, and they kind of go through some of the files and they show. Danny Castellaro's friend described the man uh, that uh, had this, you know, conversation with Danny uh, about who said he was, you know, military intelligence or whatever. It's like a perfect match of Joseph Kuehler's picture. Mm -hmm. So it's like Joseph Kuehler's dead now, but I think we can say with basic certainty he was the guy who murdered Danny Castellaro. Mm -hmm. And I think the reasons are, you know, based on what we've gone through, obvious enough. Like there's uh, a triple murder then a torture murder, and then another murder of an NSA guy, all linked to this that Danny Castellaro was looking into, mm-hmm. as well as, you know, a massive illegal conspiracy. So it's it's not surprising he ends up dead. Um, 
but yeah, the the documentary just kind of concludes with like a who really knows and just kind of focus on your life and don't forget about your friends and family. And yeah, I'm really here awesome. to tell you the opposite. Forget about your friends yeah. and family. This shit is way more interesting. Yeah, don't you want your son to think you're cool? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, your son will think you're cooler if he can watch a Netflix documentary about if you. he can see you for Other 20 than minutes sitting next day. to you watching right. a Netflix it's, documentary exactly. about someone else. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, kids only need fathers till they're like eleven or twelve. Yeah, and then, then they, they just need DVDs. Well. <laughs> they just need DVDs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, um, that's it. Join us over on Patreon. We have a little blind item about uh, some. Uh, we have a little story about a comedian and <laughs> two executives. <laughs> you said his name already. <laughs> I, I, I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, we got a lot more to talk about over <laughs> yeah. on Patreon. And also, sound off in the comments what you thought about the documentary, what you thought about Danny Castellaro. Obviously, we, there's plenty we didn't get to, but we hope you, we gave you a decent kind of overview. Yeah. What's in the documentary? Saved a bit of your time that Netflix was trying to waste. Trying to waste. Yeah. So, you're welcome. Patreon.com slash Out for Smokes. We'll see you guys next week. And maybe I'll see you this weekend in Ohio and Maryland. Uh, bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>